Sarah, Sarah Pavey, thank you very much indeed for joining the uh, NAEP YouTube site today. And you're going to be telling us something about information literacy. But before we start there, Sarah, um, could you tell us something about how you got to that point of being sort of involved with this, this type of education for us? Well, it's quite an interesting story, actually, which dates back to my years at university when I was a, I studied biochemistry and th there was an, uh, an unfortunate accident in the laboratory, which I'm still blaming on my partner in crime for the experiment. And it involved the Manchester Fire Brigade and the evacuation of a building. And right. at the end of this, my professor said come into my office i need to have a careers talk with you and well, he said yes yeah, yeah and he said whatever you do promise me you will never ever work in a lab again as long as you live <laughs> so I said right well fair enough uh, and he said yeah his advice actually was to go and run a pub but uh, but then i said that because of the biochemistry but i said no i'll find something else and i discovered this thing where you could do research um around um for companies who were making different products and i actually went and worked for shell agrochemicals for a bit um actually working in their um information science department and then went off to do my masters in information science and that dual qualifies you as a librarian so when my daughter came along I thought well I need something with school holidays and I thought I'll go and get a job as a school librarian and to my to my amazement I really enjoyed it really loved it and stayed in that business for over 20 years um, but specializing probably more in the information literacy than in the reading bit um, yeah. but because I was always interested in that and then I went off and got a, a teaching qualification and and actually then started working um, doing training and I then got a job which was only four days a week. And so I could start building up my business one day a week, specialising in things to do with information literacy. So the soft skills that you you need, um, metacognition, looking at mm. how we kind of it can embed learning um, to produce the right kind of outcomes, but cross very much cross curricular and working with inquiry work um, for our students, right from little tiny ones up to sixth form and uh, colleges. Oh. So actually, what is information literacy? Is that an easy way to, well, probably not, an easy way to su uh, summarise what information literacy is? It's a very difficult beast indeed. I think lots of people have their own interpretations of it. Some people think of it as digital literacy, and by digital literacy, they think that's being able to use a computer. They think it's yeah. being able to it, it keep safe on the internet is another prime example of it. And yeah. other people think it's just about finding information, being able yeah. to search the internet effectively. But actually, it's far more than that. I think information literacy as the um, Chartered Institute of um, Information Professionals actually state is that you know it's in all aspects of our life from whether that's health, business, um, politics, um, everything encompasses information literacy. It's knowing how to handle information. Yeah, 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 that, that, that makes a lot of difference. So therefore, uh, effectively teaching those skills to children. But the reason why SILIP is important is because last year they actually set up um, MILA, M-I-L-A, which is the um, Media and Information Literacy Alliance. Yes. And that's a kind of like an umbrella organisation for lots of smaller people who are putting together information literacy initiatives in, in this country. So, so yeah. Mila, the idea of Mila, and anybody can join Mila. You can yeah. you can join up, and even if you're an individual, you can okay, put your name on and keep yeah. and be informed. But that is that's very much um, UK based, um, really. To access that information, oh, that's that's great. Now, 
more ex even more exciting is that you you are an author as well as an educational uh, uh, consultant. Let me just share this uh, with everybody. Right? Can you can you see that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Now, uh, so it says playing games in the school library, developing game based lessons, and using gamification concepts what, what's this book all about well i think first of all the title actually makes that distinction between game-based learning and gamification which yes. is very important to understand a lot of people think that it's all the same thing it isn't game gamification is the sorts of things like scouts getting badges or when you play a video game and you get points to go to the next level um, yes. and uh, you know it, it's getting rewards for actually achieving something whereas Ooh, that, game yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> whereas <laughs> game-based learning is very much about learning outcomes so it's actually using a game and it's more to do with strategic and understanding of concepts and things like that without mm. necessarily getting a reward for it <laughs> so yeah. that's now, the now, I mean, you've got it. 10 chapters here yeah. could you take us through a couple of the chapters please? absolutely well, I think one of the things I, I was really keen to do when I wrote this book, and I have to say I wrote it in lockdown, it was my lockdown project, and one of the things that I was very keen to do was not just to have another how-to book, because yeah. there's lots of things out there in the market for play this game, play that game. So I wanted to look a bit deeper into it. And the first two chapters were really about the learning theories behind game gamification and game-based learning. So looking at the difference between the behaviorist approach, which is very like um, the gamification and the constructivist, which is more the, the game-based um, learning uh, idea. And the, the, the idea of it was, was really to look at how this impacted on game design and yes. not just that but the second chapter I actually have some pretend students I've got eight pretend students and we kind of look at how they would cope with a game-based environment and oh, what the pros and the cons are on yeah. there and they've got you know all sorts of little quirks of from the person who's very academic and thrives on getting their a grade to yeah. somebody who may have english as a second language and what games can can do for somebody like that because they may allow a different form of expression to just the the writing or the oracy that that would would normally happen in a lesson and then i kind of the next chapters are really looking at all types of games so we're not just mm. talking about the high tech you know sort of apps and video games we're talking about the sorts of games where you can just have a chat with somebody and you don't even need a pen and paper um but so it it covers the whole spectrum really of everything that we might do right up to um i've got a thing in there about live cluedo which i did where we we actually did a live version of cluedo involving the entire school for world book oh, day wow and <laughs> that was my next question. How, how how does this work with groups of children? You've taken up entire school. Oh yeah, so that's the, the mass. <laughs> Wow. So, so the idea was we had teachers who were suspects and we had some locations and some weapons. And even I didn't know the answer because I drew the cards out blindfold and put them in an envelope. And yes. then uh, teachers carried these cards with questions on them and one of the clue cards and the, the children used to chase the, the teachers round find a teacher ask them uh, the teacher asked them a question if they got it right they got shown the card which they could tick off their list you see that was the idea yeah. of it what yeah. I didn't realize was that the naughty teachers all started swapping the cards around so the children <laughs> had no idea who oh got what. no that's really mean <laughs> Yes, and it was it was great fun. And we we you know we we it took a whole week. So that was that which was the idea of it. So there were things like that. And then the, the for the chapters, I actually got case studies from thirty nine different countries all around the world. People yeah. actually sending me in ideas. And one of my very favourites was going to the, the the other the very youngest children. Um, they had this thing called toy night in the library, and mm -hmm. uh, the students brought it, their favourite toy into the library and left it there overnight. And the next day, the toy would whisper to them what it had got up to in the night oh. in the library and they wrote it down 
You no, say very were... young children. How how young are we talking about? Five year olds, six year olds. They were four five year olds. Yeah, who wow. did that? Anyway, anyway, I was relating this tale to a friend of mine who actually bought the book. She mm. said she'd done the same thing with her six form. And they'd loved it. So I guess that just shows you that age is no problem. Age, it's, it's not an age-related uh, activity. No, wow. definitely not. And then the, the final chapters really are, uh, because I think it's important that we don't just play these games just because it's fun and then end of gimmick over, but that yeah. they've actually got some legacy and some proper learning outcomes. So the last two chapters really were about, firstly, how you could use them in promotion. And although it's school mm. library, I think it, it it's equally true of a classroom or subject um, department. And then the final one is really working with the whole spectrum of people who might be there in the school and how you can use games to sort of engage them. Even even parents, because some some people were having like games at weekends where they'd send the children home with a game to play with their families over yes. the weekend, which I think. Oh, is... that's a lovely idea. I really like the sound of that. That sounds very mm. good. But as you say, it, it, it you've got down there working with teachers, senior leaders and parents. So yeah. uh, sort of adult based um, activities as well to get them oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. understanding what's going on. Well, that's yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've noticed on Amazon, you can actually get it cheaper than that. But uh, yeah. uh, that's, yeah. the, that's, got... the, that's paperback that you've got a hard copy as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is allegedly. I haven't seen the hard copy actually. So, <laughs> and you're the author. What's going I'm on? The here? No, I just got the paper back. But I think you can also buy a Kindle version of it as well. Um, yes, so, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. So, that's, yeah, that's right. uh, yeah. yeah. But it's um, it's still riding quite high in the bestsellers for library and information. It, it, I think it's oh, its yeah. peak. It was number twelve, but it's uh, and that's oh, that's 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 out of twenty thousand books. So that's not bad. <laughs> that, that's uh, pretty good, as far as I can see. That's great. Okay, is it okay if I come out of that slide now? Mm, yeah. yeah. Okay, mm. let's go back. Good. Um, why do you think it, it's so important for children to uh, through effectively? Uh, game-based activities to to play in this way what sort of um, uh, concepts what sort of thinking skills must they go through to to uh, get engaged well I, I think it, you know obviously this is where the game design is so is absolutely oh, key yes. I think because it's kind of like working backwards you've got to decide what outcomes you're going to have and then what is it you're trying to get the students to do because if it is just a straightforward learning rote learning then something that's gamification based is going to be much better but if you want them to be more creative yeah. start bringing in those sort of questioning skills the evaluation skills decision making mm. all the things that we do in everyday life then yeah. i think it's important things so i think you know it's it gives a real it can mimic a real life experience and i think when you've got somebody who's maybe um afraid of failure which is certainly something i think you know people these days a lot of mm. students if they don't get an a grade they think they failed and i yeah. think that it allows for graceful failure that you can do. And I think the other thing that I think is really important um, is that, you know, a lot of students will struggle to sit down and concentrate on something for a yeah. long time. Yeah. But, you know, put them in front of a video game and they reach that state of flow where time just flashes past and hence they're playing it till two or three in the morning you know, under the bed clothes or whatever. But I think that state of flow is something that you can engage students with through game-based learning because it yeah. becomes such an intense process that, yeah. um, that they can really learn without realising what they're doing. I, th I think that's very important to sort of motivate uh, them to do that. And I think also it helps with things like team building as well, you know, and involving yeah. everybody. And I think, you know, uh, certainly in the book, I've got examples of the very shy student, because sometimes if you've got somebody in a game based learning situation who might be a bit uncomfortable with it, there's yeah. um, something called observational motivation. So they'll sit there and they'll watch. Mm. 
and see how it's done before they actually participate. But but it's still that engagement is there. And you often see that if you're, or particularly if you work in a library where you might be teaching mm. a class in the library and you've got other people listening in on the conversation around and they yeah. want to join in too. True. And it, it's, that, it's that kind of concept on it. Mm. Yes. Uh, you, you're involved in a European project. It is actually an Erasmus project. So Erasmus. It's, it's is Erasmus, yeah. so um, which we're very lucky still to be doing, but we are. So we've got representatives yeah. here, myself and Stefan Goldstein from yes. Informal, um, and we're part of that. The Erasmus project, what that's doing is that's actually looking in six different countries. So we've got yes. um, Spain, who's coordinating, Italy, Greece, mm -hmm. Turkey, Finland. Yeah and ourselves who although we're uk we are actually looking at the english curriculum not not outside that and what we're yeah. looking to do is to look at the primary curriculum for upper key stage two so we're looking at 10 to 11 year olds 10 to 11 year olds yes Lords. yeah and we're and trying there'll be a to... questionnaire coming out at some point it's going to... Yep, there's going to be a questionnaire that um, will be um, delivered to the schools. And the idea is that it's just it's not going to be too long. It's just going to be asking you Absolutely. how you how you teach information literacy at present. Do you find it in the curriculum or is it something that you do outside of the curriculum? And if you do use things, what do you use? What products do you use? And yeah. then the idea is that we build up this international database of products and it will all be in those six languages um, and uh, everybody's going to contribute to it and hopefully it may grow. And, yeah, perhaps yeah. we're trying to avoid sort of stumbling upon information literacy at some point in a child's uh, uh, yes. uh, <laughs> education in primary schools and perhaps something mm -hmm. a little bit more cohesive, something is built into the curriculum on a year by year basis, even, you know, something that, like that. That would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. I mean, if you look at some countries, I mean, you could, France is a very interesting example because in France, mm. they've actually banned mobile phones in schools. Yeah. And yet they have a, um, a media and information literacy curriculum that mm. goes right from the time the children start school up to when they leave oh. every year. Mm. Uh, must uh, look out for that. That sounds really, yeah. really, really good. Now, was there anything else you you wanted to uh, add uh, to to our discussion? Well, as it happens. <laughs> <laughs> if people are interested in information literacy and how we can teach research and inquiry skills to students, I'm actually running a course for a company called Infinite Learning, who are based in Dubai. But luckily, it's online, so you don't have to go to. So, um, and so here are the details for this course. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about it, please, Sarah? Yeah. Well, it, it runs over two mornings and in the UK, it will be between 10 and, and midday. And what we're going to be doing is looking at all the different ways we can look at the different aspects of re research skills, the different steps in the process and mm. how you've got some practical takeaways. A few of the games that are in my book will be incorporated as well. And then there's going to be a very short overnight exercise, which will probably take you all of 10 minutes. Um, and then well, the second day will be kind of uh, addressing the other parts that we didn't do in the first day. So by the end of it, you're going to be able to have a set of practical skills that you can apply to your with your students right throughout the whole of the research process. So mm. something that you can actually put into practice. Yeah. Well, and it will be... Yeah. international delegates so the last time we oh. had delegates i think from about seven or eight different countries so it's oh, and great to share but you've got it on at 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock um uk time it says here yes. um is there any possibility for those teachers who can't make that time is it going to be uh recorded in some way it is going to be recorded probably because we had some people in the Far East last time who couldn't get up at the yeah. time they were supposed to be there. So, so um, by all means, it, the people to contact, the details are on there, are uh, infinite learning. And yeah. if you would like to just have the recording, um, then yes, please ask them. And I'm ask sure them they, and, uh, and they, they will come to an link. arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> They'll send you the link when the recording's done. Yes, well, yeah. 
Okay, well, that's useful. Good. Okay, now let's stop that. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, unless there's uh, anything else you wanted to add. I was just going to say thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you today, Mike. It's been great. Well, Sarah, thank you very much indeed. And I hope we get lots of people to see this. And uh, I hope you can share this with others as well. And, uh, and very good luck with your course. And of course, um, the Erasmus uh, project as well. I hope that goes well, indeed. So bye for now. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>